Well, hello, everybody. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I'd be standing in a conference room wearing a mask to celebrate our Honor Health Academic Affairs graduation. But here we are. My name is Priya Redakrishnan, and I'm the Chief Academic Officer and the Designated Institutional Official, also called DIO. And uh, for those of you of Italian heritage, you know that means God. And I guess if Saturday Night Live can do it, so can Honor Health. So congratulations to our graduates, and especially to their families. It's been a very long journey, and this particular journey has been extraordinarily peculiar. Many of you are going to launch into practice. Others are going to continue your journey into education. As I was preparing for this speech yesterday, I came across a tweet. And for those of you who know me well, know that I'm an avid Twitterati, tweeter. I'm not quite sure what the terminology is. But the tweet suggested that we should press Control Alt Delete on 2020. And for those of you who are uh, not computer savvy, Control Alt Delete is a way to restart. And 2020 has been an incredible year. I was very tempted to share that. Yesterday was a rough day in our roller coaster of COVID. But then I sat down and I reflected. 2020 has been a year of such immense experiential learning that if we were to wake up tomorrow and everything was just normal, I might actually feel a little, dare I say, weird. 2020 is the year where healthcare professionals, particularly our residents and fellows, discovered their inner just do it attitude. And this at a time when we expected senioritis from our graduating residents and fellows. Our motto in academic affairs was to keep calm and COVID on. 2020 is the year where we discovered our frailties and our vulnerabilities. In our healthcare group, residents, fellows, faculty, and staff, we found our inner fears Will I bring COVID home to my mom who's sick? Will I fall sick? I'm immunocompromised. 2020 was the year when many of our residents and fellows just did it. And they shared, they stepped in where they had to, and they shielded others when they had to. I am so immensely proud of our residents and fellows, faculty and staff. 2020 is the year where small things really mattered from the toilet paper in the cafeteria that our human resources department and supply chains managed to procure, to the signs that claimed us all to be healthcare heroes, to the curbside comments, the pats on the back when we were riding this roller coaster of up and down. 2020 is the year of schedules and more schedules and more calls and drafts. But 2020 was also the year in academic medicine and the rest of America where we woke up to deep-seated injustice across us all. In academic medicine and here at Academic Affairs, we celebrate diversity. We are proud of our faculty and our residents and our staff who come from all across the world. This, our faculty and residents, and particularly our graduates, have embarked on programs that impact LGBTQ care, have forced us into conversations where black faculty and staff need to be recognized. 2020 is the year in academic medicine where we have reinforced our commitment to health equity. And so 2020 really is not the year for control all delete I would say. 2020 is the year where we have challenged status quo. Nothing, it, nothing happens as we know it, from graduation to learning and teaching, from healthcare delivery. We popped up video visits overnight and suddenly 
right from the 18-year-old to the 90-year-old, they all love it. And of course, we have struggles along the way. I have no doubt that our graduates will design the wave and the healthcare delivery system of the future. And so 2020 is going to be a good year, I hope. It is now my pleasure to share a video that Dr. John Neal, who is my boss and the chief physician executive for Honor Health, he shares his message for our graduates. Please listen to Dr. Neal. So hello, and uh, thank you for inviting me to address uh, your graduation ceremony. I'd like to thank Dr. Radhakrishnan for giving me the opportunity, and really congratulate all of you on reaching this milestone. I'm sure it feels like uh, both cause for relief and cause for celebration. I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, we're really at a unique time uh, in the arc of your career, but also for a variety of reasons, we're at a unique time in our, uh, in our country, in our society. And I think it's safe to say that your residency graduation won't be the only 2020 event that you remember for the rest of your life. Um, I'll remember it, of course, as, you, as will you, but there are probably a few other things going on that we'll, we'll remember uh, maybe even longer for us. It's time for you to really start thinking about how you go from being a learner, uh, which really you've been for the past decade plus, into being a leader. Because I think it's evident uh, through our societal and national response to the COVID-19 pandemic and through some of the other things that are going on right now that society needs you to lead. Uh, if, if we're not going to lead as highly educated healthcare leaders, then, then who's going to? So I'm going to start with a personal reflection. Uh, I'm asked to give speeches or address various audiences from time to time. But uh, rather than you know, just speak to a room of uh, willing or sometimes unwilling listeners, what, what I really like to do is, is, is be in a situation where we can have some give and take dialogue and there's some, be some questions and answers. Obviously, this format doesn't allow for that. But the reason I like that so much is because, you know, back to the topic, topic of leadership, I think one of the, uh, some of the few building blocks of leadership, whether it be a physician leader or any other leader, is that leaders have to have a propensity to listen more than they speak. And I can walk around and talk all the time, but if I'm not listening, then I'm certainly not going to be able to lead. And the same is going to apply to you in your career. Secondly, leaders have to have sufficient humility to recognize that, you know, not only is it important to listen, but there's actually something to be learned from, from pretty much everybody you encounter and interact with on a daily basis. And that's going to be true of your patients. It's going to be true of your multidisciplinary colleagues. Uh, and it's going to be true of each other and your fellow physicians. And lastly, I think leaders have to have an insatiable pursuit of continuous learning and a desire to continuously improve. You know, you're not a finished product. You're, in fact, you're just kind of a started product, believe it or not. So as I look around the world right now, it's uh, pretty clear to me, and I'm sure it's clear to you, that uh, now is the time for a lot of us to do less talking and more listening. Uh, we need to learn from one another, and we need to dedicate ourselves to better understanding one another. Uh, that is true when it comes to the, you know, the devastating impact of racial inequity we are seeing ignite around the country. And it's equally true, really, when you think about what we're seeing with the COVID-19 pandemic. It's, it's being politically weaponized by both parties um, rather than really collectively and thoughtfully addressed. So, yeah, now's the time uh, when the world's a difficult place to understand. As I, and as I record this speech sitting in my office, uh, I certainly wish that this was a time when I could you know, sit, sit among you um, and have some bi-directional dialogue, but that's just not the reality we're faced with. You know, as much as we don't like it, it's appropriate for us to stay safe, to socially distance, um, and to adopt this stance. We have, we have to be evidence-based in what we're doing, because if we don't, then, then, then who in society is going to? Again, we have to, we have to lead and, and, and show the way on, on how to deal with this properly. So it's, uh, you know, so no matter how much we feel a need to be together right now, uh, we've been tasked with celebrating your residency program in this manner, so let's make the best of it. You're doctors, right? You're, you're well trained to make the best of challenging circumstances. That's, that's what we do, and, and that's ultimately who you are. So as young professionals who are graduating in the midst of this historic time in modern medicine and American society, uh, you have a choice. You can view it as a burden, or you can view it as an opportunity. A set of circumstances that provides you with a platform to demonstrate your resilience and your leadership it's your choice as to whether you, do, you, you want to adopt sort of a victim of circumstances, kind of woe is me, boy, it's a tough time, or whether you want to adopt an attitude that recognizes there's an opportunity in this crisis, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to take advantage of that opportunity. I encourage you to take advantage. So I've called upon you to be resilient and to lead, and I'll try to bring this toward a conclusion with a few thoughts on both of those concepts. First, you are resilient, period. I mean, you know, 
we talk about we need to train our residents to be resilient, and, and we do, and it's an important part of a curriculum, uh, but end of story, you're resilient. You've made it through undergraduate. You've made it into medical school. You've slogged through medical school. You've made it through, you know, into a residency, and you've managed your way through a residency. So compared to your age-based peers, you are about as resilient as they come. So don't let, ever let anybody question your level of resilience. You're, resi you're a resilient human being, and you've proven that. And so be proud of that. But nonetheless, no matter how resilient as an individual you are, there's things about, you know, healthcare delivery system that have a tendency to beat us down, right? I mean, it, sometimes it feels like it's diabolically designed to beat us down. So you're going to have to, you know, call upon your personal resilience during those times. And I, I implore you and encourage you to rely on your relationships with each other and with your family and with your community. Um, maintain a positive view of yourself. You're already, you're already living in kind of rarefied air by the fact that you're a doctor. And there's been um, a lot of talk in the last decade, oh, doctors aren't viewed like they used to be. And that might be true, but one of the real nice things about the COVID-19 pandemic has been sort of a renewed concept as healthcare workers as heroes. And I, th I think physicians and nurses and a lot of frontline caregivers have sort of renewed society's belief in who we are. And so, and so be proud of that and, and, and let, that, let that lift you up. Uh, obviously, other typical self-care things, maintain some interest outside of work, pursue spiritual interests of that, your, if, that's, if that's your thing. Um, and one other thing that I'll really emphasize is don't get greedy. Uh, you know, kind of what, what I tell my kids all the time is you, you got to call upon your inner Buddha. And if you know anything about Buddhism, um, really a, a lot of the basis for Buddhism is to not fall prey uh, to living a life where you're constantly unsatisfied, where you're always craving for what you don't have. And I see that happen to a lot of young and mid-career doctors. You know, we get out, we, there's been a lot of delayed gratification. You know, we're looking forward to earning some money, but we, but we work ourselves into a situation where we need more and more and more. And, and that's, that's sort of a self-imposed thing. And so I, so I, so I ask you to, to really think about that and be thoughtful about the choices you make during these first five or ten years of your career. Um, and never forget that a significant part of the reward for being a doctor is paid in the immeasurable thanks that you're going to get from your patients and the people you heal. And if you forget that and you are only looking to the financial aspects of it, you're never going to make enough money to be satisfied. So finally, getting back to leadership. No matter all the things you do with personal resilience, um, because there's so many inefficiencies and complexities of our healthcare system, you know, if you don't help to lead our way to a better future in healthcare, your, your level of personal resilience is going to be tested. So you, you're going to also have to help lead us to, to get to a better way of doing things. And I know you can do it because I've seen many people in my generation of doctors Who've, who've made a lot of iterative improvements, and now you're the next generation, and you're going to be able to do it. But when you do that, go back to the things I said earlier. As a leader, you have to listen first. You have to, you have to, you have to study the subject a little bit. You know, just because you're a resident, or a newly minted resident, pardon me, a newly minted resident graduate, there, there's a lot you don't know. And as you enter a new situation, I ask you to focus on first being a great medical doctor, right? Until you're a great clinician, you can't be a leader of anybody else in healthcare. So make sure that you spend the, f the first few years of your, of your career really fo honing your clinical skills. Because no doctor can lead other doctors unless other doctors view them as, as a high quality clinician. And you also have to hone your listening skills though, because you're not gonna be able to lead the other members of your team unless they think that you listen to them and that you value them. So learn how to be a listener. Just because you have the highest ranking degree in the room doesn't mean you have all the answers. Don't forget that. Be humble. That gets back. Just because you have the highest ranking degree doesn't mean you have all the answers. Willingly recognize and seek out the expertise of others. Frankly, it makes them feel good. It makes them trust you. And ultimately, it will make them willing to have you lead them. If, if they don't think you listen to them, they're not going to follow you. That's, that's just a, a core tenet. It's going to be true in your family life, and it's going to be true in your work life. So you might as well get used to it and learn how to listen and be humble. And finally, be open to criticism and never stop focusing on learning and self-improvement. As a residency grad, you're by no means the finished project. Your training to date has led you to a place where you have so much value to bring, but the minute you stop learning and improving, that value begins to diminish. It's, it's a continuous cycle of improvement, and your value is only maintained if you continue to improve and learn. So uh, I think it's obvious we live in tumultuous times. It's unique times. Your choice uh, is whether to fall victim to it or to view it as an opportunity to learn, um, show your resilience, and lead. I know you can do it. You have the resilience. You've proven it. 
but it's going to take more than just personal resilience. Over the course of your career, part of the resilience is going to be in, di is going to be in diagnosing the systemic and cultural problems and leading toward change. That's our role. You know, that we're, 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 we're gifted this role when we become physicians. Listen, be humble, and continuously learn, and build the knowledge and skills that ultimately will allow you to lead change. With that, I'll, I'll end this videotaped message, and I'll say it again. I wish I could share this experience with you in person. It's always more meaningful, and it would have given me an opportunity to learn from you. Be proud of yourself, just as your, your friends, your family, your loved ones, your preceptors are proud of you. You're embarking on the next stage of your career at a tumultuous time, but with that comes tremendous opportunity to lead change, and I can't wait to see what you do. Thank you. That was an amazing message from Dr. Neal. It is now my pleasure to introduce Todd Laporte, who is the CEO for Honor Health. Todd has truly set the tone for what leadership means for our community and Honor Health at this time of crisis. He rec recognizes the importance of Honor Health becoming a learning health system. And it's really because of his leadership that we are able to keep calm and COVID on. Todd. Well, congratulations, graduates. It's a pleasure to be here with you. You know, this is always a special event because we can celebrate a milestone that symbolizes several things. One, your personal commitment to learning and developing your skills to be the best caregiver possible. The goodwill and intellect of faculty and mentors who shared their knowledge and experience to build you up the love of family and friends who've believed in you and want the best for you, a hope from the community that your talent will keep us safe and heal us when we are hurt. And lastly, a collective pride, a pride that when we all work together, we are a society where great things can happen, where we can endure the stresses of things like pandemics, so maybe this pandemic amplifies just how important days like this are. Days when another generation of physicians are embraced, trusted by their neighbors. We apologize for this less personal way for us to virtually gather. I know this feels different for all of us, but how cool is it that we can still make this celebration happen? undaunted by having to adjust and use our ingenuity. That is our takeaway today. Be ready for anything and believe you can make positive things happen in the face of danger and in the face of challenging odds. You know, a recent study of Arizona voters conducted by High Grand, which is an advocacy consulting firm, showed that public trust ranked, that the public trust ranked hospital and healthcare systems and the professionals as who they most trusted during this COVID-19 crisis. Ahead of officials from public health, utilities, schools, ahead of the president, the governor, mayors, the point is that your stock and value was already at a high place, but it's been increasing in the eyes of the public opinion. We all need you. So Priya put some notes together for me to share with you. She suggested I call out your resilience, your willingness to work hard, your unique situations and risks that you, your graduating class has endured, especially these past few weeks. But in my stubbornness, I had to call out a private reflection or two. One of my childhood heroes was a gentleman whose voice I would hear every other night as a young boy listening to Dodger games on the radio. Vin Scully, their broadcaster, was my connection from a small town isolation to what was happening in the big city. And I, I recently heard that this 90, now 92-year-old man explain his success as simply as humility to prepare and confidence to execute. You are prepared, be confident to execute. 
My last reflection was that I've, I'm now entering my 20th year at Honor Health. And at first my job was about being a subject matter expert and along the way I received kindness from colleagues for each other and even directed to patients. And it pulled me in until I woke up one day and realized that this mission had changed me. And I've been humbled by the fact now that I own this mission along with you and that it was my duty to carry its torch and sustain that cycle for a next generation. I extend my hand to you virtually as you begin your love affair with a mission like Honor Health's. Have a great time celebrating after this virtual gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. That was truly amazing. Leadership is, is something that Todd really lives and walks every single day of his life. And yes, we have a running list of things that I recommend that he address, which he blissfully ignores uh, most of the time <laughs> and, and takes great pride in making sure that he mentions it. It is now my pleasure to share a message that Dr. Travis Glenn, chair of our House Staff Leadership Council, has recorded. Before we play the video, I want to applaud the work of Travis and Dr. Wilson, Whitney Wilson. Dr. Glenn and Dr. Wilson have really, truly done amazing things as House Staff Leadership Council. They've been our partners and they've advocated for residents and fellows for well-being and have really improved care here at Honor Health. Here's Travis. Good evening, everyone. I'm Travis Glenn, and I have had the privilege of serving as the chair for the Health Staff Leadership Council this past year, representing the voice of the residents to Honor Health. In this role, I've had the pleasure of working closely with all of the programs, their residents and staff, and the team at Academic Affairs who have all come to make Honor Health a special place to train. Tonight is a time to celebrate all of the hard work that we've done. And I don't know about you, but I for one am ready to celebrate. Reflecting on the years of effort that it takes to get to this point, one story kept coming to the front of my mind. Like most institutions, my undergraduate at Georgia Tech had a campus-wide day of service. Shortly after arriving my freshman year, the first of these events, Team Buzz, was to occur. I was one of a hundred or so students who were told that our group was going to a local school to help pick up the area. Seems easy enough, right? So we drove about 20 minutes to get to this meticulously kept playground. We looked around at one another and saw the thoughts on each other's faces. So why are we here? What are we supposed to be picking up? Shortly after our arrival, two men who looked like they were dressed for a safari welcomed us. They asked us to help them get the tools from their van and follow them. Again, the confused looks mounted around the group, but we followed them. They led us in relative silence for about five minutes into the forest behind the playground. Finally, someone spoke up and asked, what are we doing? I and probably the rest of us were not really ready for the response. With a straight face, the leaders responded by looking at the ground, bending down and pulling out a seemingly harmless ivy plant. He looked up and said, see this? This is kudzu. It's an invasive ivy that is slowly taking over the forest up and down the East Coast. We're here to pull as much of it as we can. I immediately turned to my friends and said, did I hear that right? This guy wants us to weed a forest, like weed a forest. What I didn't know at that time was just how detrimental kudzu really was. Kudzu was first introduced to the US in the 1870s after an expedition to Japan. Then in the 1930s, it was marketed as a cheap way for farmers to stop soil erosion. What we didn't know while it was being marketed that way is that it would start to quickly spread. It was like a wildfire throughout the eastern U.S. It starts as a coiled ivy on the forest floor, but then it climbs up and grows on the trees. It eventually covers the trees completely, stealing its sunlight and nutrients, slowly starving it. As the tree starves, it starts to decay, providing more nutrients to the ivy so that it can continue to spread. Not so slowly, it covers everything like a blanket, overtaking entire forests and devastating entire landscapes. So there we were, about 100 students tasked with weeding the forest in the August Georgian sun. Now, don't get me wrong, I know that here in the valley we are used to the heat, 
but it really does feel different when it's like 100 degrees and 8,000% humidity. Anyway, there we were, a diverse group of students weeding a forest, sweeping back and forth, up and down, all with the same goal, remove all the kudzu. Similar to my ignorance on kudzu that day, I had no idea how impactful this event would be for years to come, perhaps now more so than ever. I think back to working with that team, slowly pulling weed by weed, climbing the trees to make sure that nothing was left. Looking up every 15 minutes and feeling like no progress had been made, but trusting that the work we were doing was going to be meaningful one day. The hard, persistent work of weeding the forest makes me think of the work and sacrifices that we take in medicine and that our families take to get us to this point. While we spent nights and weekends learning the Krebs cycle, then the major and minor crack criteria for bacterial endocarditis, we missed birthdays, funerals, weddings, and more. The forest is the complex entanglement of medical knowledge, justice, equity, and access to care. The kudzu represents all the things that stand in our way. Each milestone we reach, finishing undergraduate, then medical school, and now training, is like a different part of the forest being weeded. Each stage, we are helped by a different team and circle of support. Some people have moved with us from one sector of the forest to the other, Others we part ways with along the way. Our training at Honor Health has given us a diverse and unique team with various life experiences and skill sets. It gave us access to tools and it gave us extra help and guidance along the way while we tried to differentiate kudzu from poison ivy. Now we can take a break to reflect on and respect how far we've come and the trees we've liberated from the slow suffocation of the kudzu. We can walk out into the sunlight and sip the tangy, refreshing lemonade. However, we cannot pause for long, for there is much left to weed. Our patients in our community need us now more than ever. We once again must leave the comfort of the pristine playground to dirty our hands and liberate access to just and equitable medical care for all. As you depart and find your new team of colleagues and support, do not forget the lessons that you have learned here while training. Do not forget the complex intricacies that social determinants play on our health outcomes. But most importantly, do not forget to bend down, get your hand dirty, and weed the forest. Thank you, and congratulations to all. Thank you, Travis. It was truly a pleasure to work with both you and Whitney as leaders of the Hustav Council. And now, it's my pleasure to present the graduates for the class of 2020. We start with dermatology, Congratulations to Dr. Mitch Manway and Dr. Andrew Newman. And here is a message from Dr. Jason Barr, their program director. Jason Barr with James Barr here, wanting to wish Dr. Newman and Dr. Manway congratulations on completion of your dermatology residency. It's been well-deserved. You both have worked very hard, and I'm proud of each of you and I'm looking forward to having you both as colleagues very soon. Congratulations. Papa. Yay! And now we present the Family Medicine Class of 2020. Dr. Bradley Glenn, Dr. Sarah Wipazinski, Dr. Travis Glenn, Dr. Heather McCall, Dr. Jeremy Webb, Dr. Jess Jade Saini, and Dr. Stephen Houston. Congratulations, and here is a message from Dr. Cindy Kegowitz, who is the Program Director for Family Medicine. Hi, graduates. I wish I could see all of you in person, but I'm glad I get the opportunity to send a brief message. So I know the last three months have really been unprecedented for all of us in a lot of different ways, but I want to make sure that recent events don't take away from us celebrating your hard work, your perseverance, your leadership, and all of the incredible teamwork that you've demonstrated throughout your training at Honor Health. So as you know, Honor Health Academic Affairs has uh, really grown immensely since you began your training. So not only in sheer size and number of trainees, but also through new and innovative educational programs and the demonstration of a lot of interprofessional teamwork and collaboration, and of course, inspiring resident leadership. 
and each of you have been a part of those successes and I just wanted to say thank you for your participation, uh, your commitment to Honor Health and your education and really for making all of us better leaders and uh, better doctors. So for my family medicine graduates, um, my dear graduates, so I'm really excited uh, that we get an opportunity to celebrate together in a few days. I'm really looking forward to that. But I just wanted to say that I feel blessed and truly thankful to have each of you as a member of our residency family and to have you as colleagues in the practice of family medicine. So for those of you who may not know, uh, the class of 2020 really has the biggest heart the loudest voice, and I say that with respect and affection, and they know that, um, and the most intense passion for family medicine, really, that I've experienced in a lot of years of resident education. So they've really embraced the specialty of family medicine in a lot of different ways, and you know, outstanding patient care and commitment to quality and safety and collaboration with interprofessional teams. Um, but really, their sincere commitment to partnering with patients and families to deliver culturally sensitive compassion and evidence-based care is really unsurpassed. So there are countless stories and patient thank yous that I could share um, and objective data to support everything I just said. Uh, but trust me, they're incredible and Honor Health should be honored to call them graduates. So I'm incredibly proud of each of you and congratulations and I'll look forward to celebrating together soon. And now I, it's my pleasure to introduce, and dare I say, my favorite, um, the internal medicine class of 2020, Drs. Dylan Doss, A.J. Santos, Daniel Davis, Janie Goodall, Evan Hunley, and Mary Gomez. And I have a special shout out to my residents. I am the interim program director for internal medicine, and I've had the pleasure of working with our graduates for all the time as faculty and this last year as the interim program director. I want to celebrate our class of 2020, a class that has really stood out for, the, for its leadership and problem solving skills. This class has been my, they've been my partners in ensuring that the transitions occurred smoothly. They stepped into their leadership roles with ease and really helped mold the program. Congratulations to the class of 2020. I also want to give a shout out to our preliminary residents who are graduating their internship. And yes, they have a long way to go before they actually graduate. Jesse, Chris, David, and Jeff, you were really outstanding and thank you for all your hard work. And our first chief resident, Dr. Brandon Bikowski, who'll be completing his chief year. And finally, many thanks to all the faculty and staff who have really worked so hard to make sure that the program continued to excel, and especially Rosa and Ivonda and the clinic staff, as well as Dr. Uche. I'm sure the class of 2020 really thanks you. Congratulations, graduates. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the class the solitary member of the class, the general surgery class of 2020, Dr. Ryan McPherson. Congratulations, Ryan. And here is Dr. Alicia Mangram with a message. Hi, everyone. Uh, what a wonderful occasion that we're all here. Uh, what a blessed occasion that we're here to um, celebrate our graduates. Uh, graduates, uh, I'm Dr. Mangrum. I know most of you all uh, in some shape, form, or fashion, and if I don't, then that's okay. I want everybody to be excited, and uh, you all should be very proud of yourselves. Don't, don't worry that it's COVID season, and why did I have to graduate during COVID time? Because uh, the reason will be shown to you at some point. You'll, you'll know why. It may be five years, ten years from now, but just be proud that you're graduating. Be proud that 
We're all surviving the COVID season. Be, be proud that you got to help take care of patients in the COVID season. So to all the graduates, every single one of you all, congratulations. I'm proud of you. Your program directors are proud of you. Your parents are proud of you. God's proud of you, etc. So my graduate, Ryan McPherson, I'm very, very, very proud of you. You have done an amazing job over the last five years. I'm so excited that you were able to get a fellowship and go on to do trauma critical care. Probably extra proud because I'm a trauma critical care surgeon and I know that you're gonna do wonderful uh, at Harborview uh, in UCLA in California. You're gonna do great there. So congratulations on your fellowship in trauma critical care. Also, I just wanna say for those that don't know Ryan briefly, uh, Ryan's just amazing. He's done amazing. He rounded with me as a fourth year medical student. Uh, that's my my push for why we need uh, medical students. Um, I think he fell in love with our system and, um, and uh, we in turn thought Ryan would be a wonderful fit. Uh, he's done great, scored well on the app side. We give out a prize every year for those that do really well on the app side. Um, Ryan has um, he's won that award. I think he won it his second year. He's done a lot of research. He's presented uh, multiple meetings. He actually is uh, near the completion of the first prospective trial done in a residency program, for sure in general surgery uh, here at Honor Health. Um, I congratulate you, Ryan. I salute you, Ryan. I will do all this congratulating and saluting you tomorrow in person uh, as we all go out to dinner and celebrate. Of course, we'll social distance ourselves. But to all the graduates, um, you've done well. Um, enjoy your time. Get ready for the next phase. If you thought you worked hard, get ready to work harder because we got to keep working harder to rise and to succeed. So I thank you all. And again, congratulations. Thank you, Alicia. And now, uh, last but definitely not the least, our Addiction Medicine Class of 2020 Fellow, congratulations, Dr. Stephen Bass. And here is a message from Dr. Michael Sutcher, Program Director of our Addiction Medicine Fellowship. Good evening. My name is Dr. Michael Sutcher. I'm the Program Director for the Integrated Honor Health Community Bridges Addiction Medicine Fellowship. I'm pleased to be here with all of you today, and I'm very excited and want to offer my congratulations to all the graduating residents and fellows uh, at today's ceremony. And of course, I'm particularly pleased to congratulate Dr. Stephen Bass, who is the second fellow to graduate from our integrated fellowship. He's a wonderful physician, has done a wonderful job, and I wish him my most heartfelt congratulations. Thank you. With that, we come to the presentation of all our graduates. So congratulations, graduates. We are truly very, very proud of you. And now we come to the fun section of presenting our awards. And so we move to the resident awards. And we have a bunch of awards. I wish you were all here, and I wish I could give you a hug and shake your hands because you've done such amazing and tremendous work. So here goes. Our first award are the uh, Quality and Patient Safety Champion Awards. Honor Health is really so proud of our residents who have contributed to, the safe, to improving the safety of our hospitals and our clinics. These awards recognize residents who've made a significant impact in their projects. So our first awardee is Dr. Haley Golick from Family Medicine. And here are the here's the, some uh, messages about Dr. Golick. This past year, Dr. Golick has served as Family Medicine resident and quality and patient safety champion. She has served in both residency and hospital-based committees, coordinated delivery of patient safety education to residents and faculty and staff, and has assisted in patient safety event monitoring. We are proud of Dr. Golick's effort and unwavering commitment to these vital initiatives. Congratulations, Dr. Golick. Our next awardee is Dr. Andrew Newman 
from the Dermatology Residency Program. And some of the comments in his nomination were, Dr. Newman has impressed us all over the last three years. He's creative and thinks outside the box. If you worked with him, then this should not come as a surprise. To mention only a few of his accomplishments, he has developed communication channels to educate dermatology residents, PAs, and NPs. We have seen a huge change in culture of our providers, physicians, and the workplace. And it goes on and on. It would fill a book. So I'm going to edit some of these comments. Congratulations, Dr. Newman. Our next awardee is Dr. Dylan Doss from the Internal Medicine Residency Program. Dylan has worked on the Ambulatory Opioid Bundle, which is a series of measures aimed at improving the care of patients who are prescribed opioids in this opioid epidemic. His work has made a big difference on safe prescribing of opioids, and the Opioid Bundle was adopted by the network. He has also received the ACP Arizona Award for his work. Congratulations, Dylan. Our next award is the Leadership Award, and this award recognizes a resident who has contributed significant leadership on team-based projects beyond their individual departments. It is no surprise that the winner of this award is Dr. Glenn. We heard from him a few minutes ago. Travis is a natural leader demonstrated by his multiple achievements in academic and community settings. During his time at Honor Health, Travis has made a valuable impact on resident education, scholarship, and the clinical learning environment. Through his demonstration of strong and inspiring leadership as the House Honor Health House Staff Leadership Council Vice Chair and then subsequent chair. We are really proud of you, Travis. Thank you. Our next award recognizes excellence in patient-centered care. Patients are the reason why we exist. And our next awardee, Dr. Janie Goodall from Internal Medicine, has consistently been recognized for her empathic communication and the quality of care that she provides to all her patients. Dr. Goodall's patients describe her as very patient, understanding, and always taking the time to listen and address her patient concerns. She's an exceptional patient advocate, and she has the most number of fabulous comments from our patients. So congratulations, Jamie. Our next resident award celebrates research and inquiry in medicine. And this award also goes to Dr. Andrew Newman. Dr. Andrew Newman has been the lead author on five peer-reviewed publications, as well as many patient education blog posts. In addition, Dr. Newman has taken a lead role being a co-program director for the Dermatology Grand Rounds. And he has been very uh, instrumental in making sure that the residents, as well as the attendings, are able to get excellent continuing medical education. So thank you, Dr. Newman. We move now to faculty. Faculty are the glue and the foundation for the academic enterprise. Faculty role model and really create that sense of safe learning in our clinical learning environment. And so the following faculty have been awarded the Excellence in Teaching Award. This award recognizes the faculty member who has demonstrated exceptional talent in medical education. Our first awardee is Dr. Sarah Estrada, who's a faculty member in the Dermatology Residency Program. She's also the laboratory director and a dermatopathologist. I love the comments that the residents who, and faculty who nominated her. The comments were that she engages residents by simplifying complex dermatopathologic concepts and makes this intimidating subject more accessible to residents. Dr. Estrada showed me everything from histo lab to actual dermatopath. She loves to teach, she's knowledgeable, and attentive to details. Congratulations, Dr. Estrada. 
Our next awardee is well known in our academic enterprise. It's Dr. Andrea Darby Stewart from Family Medicine. Dr. Darby Stewart has an extensive career in resident education, touching the lives of countless residents. And this past year, she has created and implemented a patient experience curriculum, a longitudinal patient safety and quality curriculum, and a centering healthcare group visit curriculum. It's a privilege and honor to support Dr. Darby Stewart and her excellence of teaching at Honor Health. Congratulations, Andrea. Our next awardee is Dr. Varun Chakravorty, whose faculty general surgery residency program, as well as the simulation director. Dr. Chakravorty is recognized for his work with the general surgery residents. He has provided a safe place to learn and a much needed focus on well-being. And he has also developed the simulation curriculum for general surgery. Congratulations, Varun. And our last excellence in teaching awardee is Dr. Kara Asbury, who is an infectious diseases specialist and the internal medicine residency faculty. Dr. Kara Asbury is recognized by the re residents for her evidence-based approach to the treatment of infectious diseases, her caring attitude, and her commitment to education. She's also recognized for her nurturing spirit, especially to inquiry. Congratulations, Kara. Our next faculty award goes to this dynamic duo. It's our network quality and patient safety award, which recognizes faculty who have made a significant impact in uh, patient safety and quality. Prior to COVID, our world was consumed by burnout. And uh, this dynamic duo, Dr. Wendy Ellis and Dr. Sarah Snell, have really taken on as their mission to build programs for the caregivers. Their program is called Care for the Caregiver, as well as peer mentoring programs in medical education. They've designed these programs to tackle the difficult issues of burnout. Their commitment to medical trainees speaks volumes. And, and their sessions are always highly regarded by our residents. Congratulations. <laughs> our next award, a set of awards, goes to curriculum building. Curriculum is the fabric by how which we teach. And really, building curricula takes enormous amount of work, as well as enthusiasm. As, and finally, it's the implementation of the curriculum is evaluated by results. Our awardees have done exceptional work in building curricula at Honor Health. Our first awardee is Dr. Kioli, Dr. Nandita Kioli, who is the Physical Medicine and Rehab Residency Program Director. Dr. Kioli has established the Longitudinal Curriculum for Research, Evidence-Based Medicine, and Quality Improvement. She integrates interprofessional education within Journal Club, Grand Rounds, and other learning experiences. We are honored to be her colleagues and look forward to many more years of serving with her as a scholar and a leader. Congratulations, Dr. Kioli. Our next awardee is Dr. Dimitri Bisk from Family Medicine. Dr. Bisk has enthusiastically and unequivocally embraced the development of residency curricula to educate staff, faculty, and residents regarding opioid use and opioid use disorder, as well as the medication-assisted treatment. He has worked in collaboration with many Honor Health programs and departments and interprofessional team members. He is commended for his efforts, creativity, and multidisciplinary approach to supporting the education of an intimidating but crucial topic for GME. Congratulations, Dimitri. Our next award is a value award. ICARE stands for innovation, collaboration, accountability, respect, and empathy. And this award is given to an individual or a group that has made a meaningful contribution to medical education. And this year's awardee is Dr. Connie Abereku, faculty in internal medicine residency program. 
Dr. Beriku is an internist's internist. She lives and breathes the eye care values. She's a role model for the internal medicine residents and her commitment to patients and colleagues and staff is commendable. She has a strong focus on well-being and participates in projects affecting patient care. Congratulations, Connie. And our last award is our Honorary Fellow Award. This award recognizes a staff member or an administrator who has contributed to residency education. This year's awardee is Roxanne Flynn, who is no stranger to medical education. Roxanne is the network manager for the Military Partnership Simulation Training Center and Emergency Management and Central Communications. She is all things simulation for Honor Health, and she is the go-to person if anyone has a question regarding curriculum, resources, planning, course design, or support. We really recognize Roxanne's commitment and contribution to GME through this Honorary Fellow of, Year, Fellow of the Year Award. Congratulations. <laughs> and with that, we come to the end of our virtual graduation. I want to thank you all. It really takes a village. And uh, as you saw with barring minor technical difficulties, <laughs> and I'm hoping you're watching this as I say this, uh, I hope that we came close to Saturday Night Live, uh, but maybe not, and we'll continue to work on this. Congratulations, class of 2020. We are incredibly proud of you your leadership, your commitment, and we have no doubt that you'll do wonderful things. I want to especially thank Cecilia, as well as Carol and Diane from Academic Affairs, J2 Media, come on guys, <laughs> and all the staff uh, for Academic Affairs, as well as the program directors, faculty, and definitely IT department at Honor Health. You've got to come closer. <laughs> and so with that, we want to thank you for attending our virtual graduation. A big guy. Uh... And I'm going to end with a quote from Osler to remind you that soap and water and common sense are the best disinfectants. Keep calm and COVID on. Congratulations, class of 2020. Bye-bye. <laughs>